Radio check, uniform. Five out of five, Kermit. Again, uh, Ops is calling ahead so we don't have to get startup clearance, so go ahead and grab ADIS and get the APU up and let me know when you're ready for radio check using the frag frequency, okay? Roger that, 335 on Fox and, uh, and what for Victor? Go 128 on Victor, okay, waiting for your mark.
Okay, all systems up and alignment is started. Ready to copy. Great, here's the game plan for today. We're going to start with some useful options in the HUD set up, then we're going to move on to creating our flight plan. We'll briefly cover the waypoints and attributes, then we'll then take off and continue with other stuff like checking the attribute behavior of flight, playing with the HFI, creating mark points, and last but not least, changing the anchor point. Ready? Yes, sir. Right on. All right, the HUD, I assume you have already finished a bit and switched on your FC. You now use the HUD in one of five modes that can be changed by pressing the master mode control button on your stick. A firm. Navigation, guns, CCIP, CCRP, and air to air. Good. Don't get carried away with the air to air part though, as we'll be training on that mode in one of our upcoming sorties. Great. Can't wait. Let's first get back to the basics, shall we? Go ahead and push that IFC button back into the test or middle position. Yes, ready to move on. So the select rocker switch changes the line selection up and down. Data cycles the line selection and enter lets you select the line option. Go ahead and see how it works and let me know when you're ready to move on. I'm ready. Let's move from the top to the bottom of the list while going a bit deeper into some of the more useful options. First line called CTIP Consent Option lets you choose the CTIP Consent Release Mode, which we'll cover more in detail when we get to drop the bomb. Copy. The next line is called Bit or Built In Test Menu. It is used to test several chosen IFC subsystems or all of them at once, like you already did in your normal startup. Alright. Third line is called AAS the air-to-air sub-menu. We will get into more details on the air-to-air -air training I mentioned before, but for now, suffice it to say that you use this menu to alter and select the gun funnel for air-to-air -air combat by using either presets or manual settings. Copy. The gun must be totally devastating to air targets. Oh yeah. Did you read about Captain Bob's 
Swain, the guy who scored the first air-to-air -air kill with the Avenger back in 1991, described hitting the Iraqi Helu with 300 rounds? Nope. What did he say? Then it looks like if the helicopter was hit by a bomb. They tried to ID what he destroyed afterwards, but it was blown into such tiny pieces that it was impossible. Anyway, let's move on, shall we? Wow. Okay. Now get to the weapons menu, which you use to set the parameters of your 30 mic. This will typically be done by the ground crew before the mission, so we don't need to go through it now. Hmm. On second thought, go ahead and press enter into the sub menu. Alright, done. You'll see a lot of data here which you will never change yourself, like type of ammo, manufacturer, numbers of rounds loaded, etc. However, here you can also enable or disable pack one mode and set the minimum altitude used to determine elevation and reference the gun minimum range Q. We'll cover that in detail during the gunnery training. Once you're ready, go ahead and return to the main menu by pressing exit.
that's all there is to it. Go ahead and switch the FC button back into normal mode, please. Stand by on ground. Nellis ground, Tusk 1 is two A-10s and Thunder with Kilo, ready taxi. Tusk 1, taxi Charlie, Golf, Alpha, hold short, zero, 03 right. Taxi Charlie, Golf, Alpha, hold short, zero, 03 right, Tusk 1.
one holding short zero three right. Push to tower frequency. Nellis Tower, Tusk One Flight, holding short runway zero three right, ready for departure. Tusk One Nellis Tower, wind is two three zero for zero five, cleared for takeoff zero three right. Clear for takeoff zero three right, Tusk One.
turn for 248 over truck stop for Tusk 1. Tusk 1, clear to resume on navigation. Clear for on navigation, Tusk 1. I feel comfortable enough to ask now. What's the story with your call sign? You first. Fair enough. 
Fair enough. So, Kermit is obviously a reference to the frog from the kids' show. Why this innate ability to attract rather hefty women for some inexplicable reason? It never fails. Every time I go out to the bar, some fat chick is bound to hit on me. As you know, Kermit is constantly being chased after by Miss Piggy, so there you go. It was an easy kill. <laughs> That's awesome. So, you were about to tell me about yours? Alright, so, this is an acronym for Big Inbred Farming Fucker. I grew up in rural Kansas on a farm, that plus chewing, and being into hunting, fishing, and other redneck shit apparently means I'm inbred. Then there's the fact that apparently I look like Biff from Back to the Future. <laughs> God, I see it now. What's that, the inbred part or looking like Biff? <laughs> yes. You'd better be careful. You need me to sign off on your training. I'd hate for you to get washed out and wind up on Preds or some shit. Ooh, that's not even funny. Off to the west here, you'd be hard to miss Mount Charleston, or more accurately, Charleston Peak, at a shade under 12,000 feet. Where was it? It's going to be off to the west, your left side. That's, uh, your Air Force left? Still not seeing it. Dude, look out of the canopy to the left. Look for all of the green. Ha ha. Sorry, I couldn't resist. You were saying? I was saying it's not too late to get you into an MQ-1. So, the big conspicuous mountain off your left side is a really nice place to visit. There's a neat restaurant to grab some lunch at and some more fun roads to drive around on. Yeah, it looks really pretty with the trees and everything. Yeah, most of those are bristlecone pines and they can live to be over 5,000 years old. They're really something. Also, it's usually much, much cooler up there, which is a nice change of pace in summer. And there's also a ski resort open when there's enough snow. I'll have to head up there one of these days. How long is the drive to get up there? That's not too bad. From the front gate, maybe an hour up and an hour back. I forgot to mention it, but there's also a lot of really nice hiking trails up there. Good deal. I love hiking. for RPAs like MQ-1 Predators and MQ-9 Reapers. They do pilot training for them up here, right? Yep, that's correct. Sometimes you can catch the Batwing operating up here, and the uh, Thunderbirds practice just to the north. The Batwing? Yeah, the Lockheed RQ-170 stealth drone flying wing thing. Ah, okay. Now I'm tracking. They also operate a lot of rotary ring out of here for the various flags and exercises. That makes sense, being a bit closer to the ranges and stuff. Exactly. Alright Kermit, we're going to be heading into the NTTR for the first time today. We'll need to contact Blackjack and get clearance in out of the airspace. I'll handle those calls since this is our first time heading up there. Let's go 377.8 and stand by. 377.8, copy. And one is up. Blackjack, Tusk 1. Tusk 1, I take Cindy. Plus one is going to be a true ship of A-10s near Creech at Angels 10 looking for entry for a local familiarization flight. Test cleared and carrier dispatched. All ranges should be cleared. Cleared for entry, Tusk 1.
So, we have a nice long flight plan for today, which we are going to follow meticulously because we're going to be close to some restricted areas. I'll point out some of the highlights around the NTTR, but we also need to do some training. And for that, I want you to create another flight plan that we will use only for training. Okay, sounds interesting. Alright, first use your autopilot and put your plane in a right-hand orbit. When ready, please press the waypoint button on the CDU or on the UFC. Also, make sure that you have the CDU repeater up on one of your MFCDs. Yeah, got it. 30 
742 00 North 116 1104 West. Check up line 9 on the CDU shows L slash L as the chosen coordinate system. If not, press the OSB or line select key next to it to select the lat long mode. Set. Okay, so now that you have the first waypoint, let's create another one together. But you'll be alone from this point onwards. Okay, it doesn't seem too complicated. Good. Go ahead and press OSB9 again to add another waypoint. Disregard. I forgot to tell you about this option called Copy to Available Mission Point. It creates a new waypoint using the same coordinates and elevation as the one you have currently selected. Let's play with that function, so please do that now.
is AMGRS coordinates, but first let's change its name from the default MSN 012 to Train 2. Let me know when you've done that. Okay, Train 2 is set. Now change the system from lat long to QTM by pressing OSB 10 or right line select. line appearing on the left side of your CDU screen. In order to use the MGRS coordinates, you first need to make sure that you have introduced a correct UTM grid, which consists of two numbers and a letter. So for Nevada, this would be 11 Sierra. Type it in your keypad and press OSB 17 or left line select E3. Okay, done. Good, now for the coordinates. It always consists of two letters in between four and ten digits. The more digits you introduce, the more precise the waypoint designation will be. So go ahead and type in both letters and ten digits for train two as listed in the knee board. Okay, done. Sweet. Now check for correct elevation. You should still be 10,000 feet. And once you've done that, go ahead and add all the remaining waypoints using either UTM or the lat long system, whichever you prefer. So give me a shot when you're ready and we'll build a flight plan out of them. Copy, we'll go. All the waypoints are now in the CDU, ready to move on. All right, let's exit the orbit and set waypoint three as our steer point.
based on that flight plan, off to the right you can see the Nevada test site, now known as the Nevada National Security Site and its many craters. This is where we used to test our nuclear weapons. Yeah. Wow, it looks like the moon. All of those from nukes? Yep, from 1951 until 1992 they detonated almost 930 weapons there. 100 were above ground atmosphere tests and the remainder were underground tests. They tested all kinds of stuff there and looked at using weapons for civilian purposes like mining and earth moving. There's so many craters. It's pretty surreal. Yeah. I know. So, just over the mountains there, to the east, is, uh, Groom. Aren't they downwind from the site? That's not a problem. From what I've read, out of an awful book, and according to some of the guys I know who used to work there, there were occasions where sometimes fallout would get a little dicey so they would restrict operations and whatnot. But then there's the whole St. George and Conquer. Okay, bring me up to speed on that. St. George, Utah is like a 140 mile downrange from the NTS, and they have an elevated instance of certain types of cancers attributable to nuclear testing. Things like leukemia, lymphoma, and thyroid cancer, just to name a few. Well, they shot this movie called The Conqueror, starring John Wayne near there, in the early 50s. The story goes that they were doing some test shots here at the NTS, during the filming, and a bunch of people that were there on set died from cancer in the years after. Damn. Yeah, not our proudest moment. Alright, back to work. Now we're ready to build a flight plan using the waypoints which we have introduced earlier. Get our current steer point on the nose and set the autopilot to altitude heading hold mode. Okay, done. So is this the default mode of operations during most of the missions? I mean, keeping it in flight plan mode? Yes, especially during the ingress, egress, or until we need to exploit something one of the other modes gives us. Flight plan shows us the entire route with waypoints connected by a green line, which helps you make sure that you're not wandering off someplace you're not supposed to be, like into a Sam West or across the border. Raj, okay. I'm ready to continue. Right on. So, first a few words of introduction. To enter the flight plan mode, make sure that your AAP page select switch is set to other, and AAP steer page is on the flight plan. Remember that you can have up to 20 flight plans, each consisting of up to 40 waypoints. Ready. Next, go ahead and enter the flight plan page by either pressing the FPM button on the CDU or function, then 5 on the UFC. Let me know when you've done that. Done. Okay, you'll see that there is already one flight plan stored in the CDU. It was prepared during the mission planning phase and was uploaded from the DTS together with the loadout information and other information when you hit load all. However, important that you know how to create one for yourself, independent of the DTS. Alright, that makes sense. The page should now be showing us 01 Auto MSN in the top and 02 New FP in the bottom line. First we need to enter the name of the new flight plan in the scratch pad. Let's call it Train. Once you have typed that, please press the lowest left line select key or OSB in order to create a new flight plan. Let me know when you've done that. Okay, train flight plan created. Good, you should now be back at the main flight plan page. And your new plan is listed next to number 02. If you press the second left line select key for OSB 19, 
set train as your active flight plan. By pressing it again, you can cycle between manual or automatic cycling of our waypoints as we pass them. All we need to do now is to add the waypoints to our flight plan. Okay, how do I do that? Press the flight plan build line select key next to the flight plan you want to modify. So in this case, flight plan 2. To add a waypoint to the open flight plan, enter the number or the name of the waypoint you wish to add using either the CDU or UFC keypad. Type train 1 for the name and let me know when you're ready to press on. CDU has even suggested train 1 as a waypoint. Cool. Now I'll press the second line select key on the left, or OSB 18, next to 01. Done. Perfect. Go ahead and add the remaining three waypoints to the flight plan in the order listed in the knee board. Give me a heads up when you're finished. Flight plan is now set. Good. Take a look at your TAD, and you should see that your flight plan has formed a rectangle over Coyote Delta. However, it is still open on the eastern side. To close it, please add train 1 as your fifth waypoint to the flight plan, and let me know once that's done. Okay, the rectangle's closed. Why would I want to create such a plan? Like a patrol pattern? This one is useful if you're assigned to a kill zone and you want to be sure that you stay within it. And we'll use this one to learn more about waypoints and tribute in the later part of the story. For now, switch back to the main flight plan and continue towards the Kona Pop. Coming up on the Tonopah Test Range Airfield. You should see it off the nose now. I know it's interesting, but don't forget to turn towards the waypoint 5, okay? Raj and Visual. This place has some pretty interesting history, yeah? For sure. Most recently, it's where most of the F-117s were brought when they were retired. And there's rumors of other things happening around these parts if you smell what I'm stepping in. Yeah, copy. Back in the mid-70s, they also moved the 4477 Tactical Evaluation Squadron, or Red Eagle, and their MiGs up here. I think the Tonopah will always be best known for the F-117 program, now. I agree. So, back to the Red Eagles. What types of aircraft were they supposed to have flown out of here? Pretty much all of the Russian-designed fighters built up into the 80s. So we've got MiG-17s, 19s, 21s, 23s, 25s, and 29s. The SG-22 supposedly was there also, and some Chinese variants of Russian aircraft like the J-6 and even an F-7. Wow, that's quite a collection. Yes indeed, if you get the chance, pop by the threat training facility or petting zoo over by the red flag building while you're here. You can't miss it, as there's an SAA parked out front. And in the event, you end up dropping by to have a MiG-29 and MiG-23 inside the building that you can climb up into. And outside they have all kinds of armor and a few choppers. Pretty cool little spot if you have some time to wait. Sounds like it. I'll have to head over there and check it out one of these days.
Since you're apparently a history major, can you elaborate a little more on the F-117's operations here at Tanopa? Yeah, sure. So, in the early 80s, as the Senior Trend Project was moved over to the operational side, they shifted the entire F-117 program from Groom to Tonopa. The base was pretty sparse, so they had to build it up. They added all the security measures, support infrastructure, dorms, and the rows of hangars that became known as the canyon. Dorms? So people were actually stationed up here? No. Well, most were not in the traditional sense. So, they were actually assigned to Nellis, but they would get flown up here on Monday, and then they'd get flown back to Nellis at the end of the work week. Keep in mind that the F-117 was a black project until really the spring of 1990. Being black, a lot of stuff was kept in charge figuratively and literally. I'd imagine. So what did these folks tell their families what they were doing all week way up in the high desert? The story was that they were doing stuff with A7s up there. A7s, huh? That's funny. In hindsight, yeah, it's pretty funny covering up what at the time was one of the most advanced and revolutionary aircraft in history with the slough. So these days they just keep most of the retired F-117s and Type 1000 stores here just in case we need to bring them back into service. If the internet is to be believed, there's still some flying around these days. Yeah, I saw some, I mean, something about that the other day on the internet. Hmm, maybe if it's true, we'll see one. Wouldn't that be something? Yeah, 
Okay. Two from is the default setting for the steer attribute. What it basically does is it allows you to determine the desired course to or from the given waypoint using the HSI knob. It's especially useful if you want to perfectly align yourself with the runway or set up on an attack run with a very specific heading. Okay, makes sense. The 2-2 two -two attribute computes the line between two waypoints. In this mode, the HSI knob will be used to align the course arrow with the heading displayed on the attribute page for a consistent course deviation indicator, ADI bank steering bar, and CDU position page cross-track deviation indication. Uh, okay. Yeah, I know, it sounds complicated at first, but it'll get easier when we do some practical exercises. Direct is the third steer mode. This one is much more straightforward as it sets the course from the aircraft position when direct mode is selected to the current steer point. As with the 2-2 mode, you will use the HSI knob to align the course arrow with the heading displayed on the CPU attribute page. Right. Finally, in the SCS mode, the commanded course is a manually selected course away from the point where the aircraft was located at when SCS was selected. So you'll want to set it using the HSI course select knob. Alright. Next tribute is the vertical navigation mode, which you can find on the right side of the CDU screen. It has two settings, 2D and 3D. In 2D, only horizontal data will be passed onto the HSI and ADI, so you won't get the steering cues to intercept the waypoint's altitude. Okay, Raj. The 3D mode allows to have a vertical angle computed either automatically or entered manually, which will then give you the possibility to also the virtual steering cues of your ADI. Yeah, got it. Nice. Let's prepare a few more things and we can move on and do some practical exercises. Cool? As ready as one can be. So first, let's get the hang of 2-2 two, two and 2-from two mode. Press FPM on your CDU and press the second line select key on the right, mark the small arrow next to the train flight plan. Okay, I've done that. I can see a list of waypoints that I've added before. Arrow next to each one and WPTATT text above. Pressing each of the arrows will take you to the attribute subpage specific for that given waypoint or the selected flight plan. Press the arrow next to waypoint 11 or the first train one. Warning autopilot. list of settings that you just described. Exactly. Leave the scale as it is, but change the steer setting for me into 2-2 two -two mode. Flight plan and do the same. 
same thing for all of the waypoints in there. But we're going to leave train 4 as 2 from. Let me know when you've done all that. Okay, all waypoints set according to instructions. Very good, now choose train flight plan as uh, our active one, and Warning, set the waypoint changing to auto. Next, select waypoint 14 or train 4 as your steer point. Flying a very specific heading, say 270. Currently, waypoint 14 should be somewhere to our 7 or 8 o'clock, which is indicated by the thin arrow on your HSI. A firm. Okay, use the HSI course select knob and set the desired course to 270. Once you've done that, you will notice that the CDI needle has moved away from the course arrow, which is currently pointing directly to the left. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. In order to align ourselves directly with the desired course, we will need to first go north for some time. Go ahead and turn heading 360 and keep 270 knots indicated. Watch as the CDI is closing to the center of your HSI. And when it is one dot away, start a 15 degree left hand turn and try and align yourself perfectly with the steer point.
All right, I'm aligned and on course. Great. Now press the nav button on the CDU and select the attribute subpage. In the lower right corner, you will see that your HSI is set as course 270 or thereabouts. This is the digital readout of what you have set on your HSI using the knob. Yeah, got it. Staying on this page means your steer point up to the second train one waypoint, the one closing the flight plan. As you have previously set it to tribute and it is in 2-2 mode, the text is changed and says dial HSI course 256 X-ray. Go ahead and set that course on the HSI. Okay, done. As you're approaching waypoint 14, you'll see that the CDI is aligning with the course arrow. Try and have it aligned perfectly in the middle as you turn and continue towards waypoint 11. Alright, I think I'm there. Nice. Prepare yourself for the next turn and move your steer point first down to waypoint 11 and then up to waypoint 12. Check the HSI setting given in the nav attributes page and dial it before reaching your current steer point. If you look at your course arrow, you will notice that it aligns exactly with the green line on the TAT connecting waypoints 11 and 12. So in a way, your HSI is showing you where you'll want to turn in relation to your current course. When ready, begin your turn. Again, try to align the CDI perfectly with the course arrow. If you do it correctly, you will also see on your TAD that you're riding the green line connecting waypoints 11 and 12. Let me know after the turn and when you're ready to move on.
One is on course to waypoint 12. Good shit. Next rotate your course set knob left and right. You'll notice that it has no impact on the CDI needle, which remains in place. This is because in two two mode, you'll use the course set to align your course arrow with the desired route. Now return to nav page, press the tribute sub page, move one waypoint up to waypoint three. Set the course accordingly and turn when ready. En route to waypoint 13. Cool. So you think you're riding the green line perfectly? Let's see. Press the FPM button, select the train flight plan, and enter the attribute subpage for waypoint 13. Warning, autopilot.
Okay, done. As you can see, the CDI will move towards the center as you align the course arrow with your current steer point. This is the main difference between the two from mode, where you choose the heading you want to use in order to get to the selected steer point, and the two to mode, which can be best described as a line connecting the previous waypoint to the current steer point. Roger. Right on. The last two things I wanted to show you today in relation to the waypoint attributes are direct and 3D mode. For starters, once again, go to the flight plan menu page and choose the MSN flight plan as the active one. Okay, main flight plan selected. Now press the arrow next to the asterisk under Flight Plan Build. Navigate to Waypoint 6, which should be next to Position 07, and enter the Tributes page. Warning, autopilot. Okay, done. Now do me a favor, turn towards waypoint 6 and then set the steer setting to direct. What this does is that when you press it, it plots the course from the position of your aircraft to the selected waypoint. In this mode, turning the HSI knob will not move the CDI as your aircraft should now follow an imaginary line between the point in which you switch to the waypoint to direct mode and the current steer point. Uh, let me get this clear. So I can set the direct mode beforehand, but the CDU will start computing the course at the exact moment when I select this waypoint as a steer point for the first time. Exactly. So if you align yourself at the given waypoint and then set the attribute to direct, you will be on the correct course from the outset. As soon as you set the attribute, the nav attribute page will give you the correct heading you need to align the course needle. Okay, roger. It works as a 2-2 mode, but treats the initial position of the aircraft as a previous waypoint. So what about the 2D and 3D modes? Yeah man, that's it. Let's keep waypoint 6 as our current steer point. Press the waypoint button on the CDU, and then use OSV7 or the first line select key on the right to enter the waypoint subpage. Alright, I'm on the waypoint subpage now. Press 6 on the numpad and press OSB 19 or the left line select key 1. Elevation. 
elevation is set to 7,000 feet. Go ahead and change it to 15,000 feet by typing it on the keypad, and then press in OSB 18 or left line select. All right, the altitude's now set. Let's take a look at your ADI. The vertical steering arrow on the left will be way up, showing you that you need to climb in order to intercept the required altitude up to waypoint. So we'll give you steering cues similar to the ones used for glide slope on ILS landing. Cool, pretty neat. What happens if I change the attributes back to 2D? Um, they'll disappear. Okay, that's it. Pretty sure it'll take some time before all that knowledge sinks in. Practice it as often as you can and play with the attributes. Raj. Just remember to change the attributes for waypoints in flight plan mode. You have to do that via the flight plan menu page. In mission mode, you can do that through the general attributes. In nav mode or separately for each waypoint menu. Speech? Yep, I think I got it. Good deal. The last thing to remember is that 2-2 mode will only work correctly if you cycle the waypoints up, but won't work if you're going backwards. And with that, we'll conclude today's lesson on waypoint attribute. Let's pass waypoint 6 and keep quiet for a moment, and I need to drink some water and rest my voice for a minute.
Warning, autopilot. Okay, set. Sweet, as I've said before, you'll notice that the desired time on target has also changed in order to be in line with the introduced desired time to go. I'll take a look at your HUD. Below your current speed, you'll notice a letter R with the value next to it. A firm. That's the required speed, and it hangs there from time to time, like before as well. Promo, Sherlock. And yeah, sometimes those values are added in the cartridge. In order to get rid of it, you'll need to enter the attribute page and press the LSK or OSB next to desired time on target or time to go, and it will disappear. Okay, now match your speed with the required value. Copy. As you do so, take a look at the right side of your HUD. You can see the remaining time followed by a slash and value with a plus or minus in front. A firm. This shows you how many seconds before or after the desired time you will arrive if you keep your current speed. So if there's a plus, it means you're going too fast and will arrive too early. If there's a minus, you're too slow and will arrive too late. Got it? Pluses, I'm too fast, minus too slow. Gotcha.
Time's up. Where are you in relation to waypoint A? One is at waypoint eight. Perfect timing. Okay, I think you've got the hang of it. That's it for today. I know we're probably supposed to cover some more stuff, but I think it's enough for one day already. Continue with the flight plan. I'll contact Blackjack and clear us out of the range. Please ensure you're still on 377.8.
Dallas Tower, Tusk 1 1 is 5 miles out for runway 21 left, full stop. Tusk 1 1, Dallas Tower, wind is 030 for 10. Check landing gear, clear to land, runway 21 left. Clear to land, 21 left, Tusk 1 1. Altitude, altitude. Roger, vacate Alpha, contacting ground, Tusk 1-1. One, one. North Tower, Tusk 1-2 one, on, final for runway 2-1 left, full we'll stop. Tusk 1-2, Nellis Tower, winds are 030 for 10, check landing gear, clear to land, runway 2-1 left. Clear to land, 2-1 left, Tusk 1-2.
Nellis Ground, Tusk 1-1 one one is just off 21 left at Alpha for taxi back to Thunder. Tusk 1-1, one one, taxi Alpha, Charlie, Golf for Thunder. Taxi Alpha, Charlie, Golf, Tusk 1-1. One one.
Thank <laughs> you. 